So I trust that you've all found Romans chapter 7, page 1095 in the Church Bibles. Today we celebrate the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. I wonder what you think about saints with a capital S, somewhat out of reach, perhaps holier than thou, perfection personified. The Roman Catholic Church has thrown its lot in with St. Peter, a big time, sword-wielding Peter, who struck off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Paul, by contrast, has been referred to as the Protestant apostle. See what he writes in verse 18. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. How different the course of church history might have been if the Roman church had gone for Paul as its champion, perhaps the Reformation needn't have happened. Incidentally, there's zero evidence that Peter was ever Bishop of Rome. More importantly, the Bible knows nothing of capital S saints. Anyone who is a Christian is called a saint in the Bible. And that means a mixture of good and bad. That which I aspire to be versus that which I am, as Paul was only too aware. The heresy of Pelagianism, the denial of original sin, was, I'm sorry to say, devised by a Brit. But that was back in the 5th century, and I'd like to think that we've wised up since then. From the newspaper of the Diocese of Niagara, the concept of original sin is the key to obsolete beliefs, including propitiatory sacrifice and substitutionary atonement. Humanity is not fallen. Perhaps the Diocese of Niagara is what Andrew Young had in mind when he penned, There is a happy land far, far away. Or perhaps not. Personally, I prefer to stick with the real world, certainly as we face it in Vancouver. Paul says, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. It's become conventional in some circles to talk about inviting Jesus into your life. The reality of what happens when we become a Christian, a follower of Jesus, is actually the other way round. We join Jesus in his life. Look back at verse 8 of chapter 6. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. When Christ died, you, as a Christian, also died and rose from the dead. That's how close our relationship with Jesus is. Paul continues, verse 11 of chapter 6. In the same way, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 5 of chapter 7. 
For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies, so that we bore fruit for death. Before we were in Christ, believing in his death and resurrection, death was all we were heading for. But now we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. For the Christian, the effect of sin cannot reach beyond the grave. That's the point of Paul's illustration from marriage in verses 2 and 3 of our passage. Paul has established that Jewish religious law is not, cannot be, our means of salvation simply because we repeatedly fail to keep it. It's only by being in Christ believing in Jesus' death on our behalf and his resurrection, that we can meet the law's demands and beat the sting of death. But then, Paul continues in typical, punchy, rhetorical, lovable style. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. But what good is the law? What is its purpose? All it seems to do is condemn me, leading to my death through sin. Elsewhere, in Galatians 3.24, Paul talks of the law as being our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Martin Luther writes in his commentary, The law is meant to drive us to Christ. When the law is properly used, its value cannot be too highly appraised. It will take me to Christ every time. O Rector, we didn't know what sin was until you came. I say this tongue in cheek, of course. More seriously, Paul says. I would not have known what sin was except through the law. It's good that the law shows that I'm sinful. When I realize that, I will, as Luther says, turn to Jesus Christ as my only Lord and Savior. The truth of human nature means that unless and until we realize the utterly sinfulness of sin, we won't acknowledge our true need and truly turn to Jesus. An acknowledgement of the reality of the effect of sin and the need for repentance are vital to genuine Christian discipleship and commitment. As followers of Jesus, however, We continue to live in the world as it is, and with ourselves as we are. In one sense, the person who has committed his life to Christ, to following Jesus, is totally changed. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone The new has come, 2 Corinthians 5.17. But whereas I may have a new heart and mind, I don't yet have a new flesh. Verse 22. In my inner being, I delight in God's law, 
but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in my members. Now I say not yet, for at Jesus' return, even our bodies will be transformed. Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The theme of being rescued is a popular one in popular culture. I guess it's a sign of my age that I thought first of Fontella Bass's 1965 hit, Rescue Me, rather than 30 Seconds to Mars, slightly more meaningful lyrics. I'll leave you to look them up and make of them what you will. In verse 24 of our passage, a typical Pauline, what a wretched man I am. He always goes the full hog. He asks, who will rescue me from this body of death? Again, he answers his rhetorical question straight away. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is our only rescue, our only saviour. Have you accepted his lordship of your life? Are you willing to do so? I've mentioned before the wise words of a speaker at the Christian Union at Durham. If you're worried about having blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, you haven't done it. It can be, ironically, a good sign to be troubled by your sinfulness. It's a sign that the Holy Spirit's at work. Justin Moat writes, the conflict itself, rather than any victory over sin, is the evidence of the Spirit. If you are a real Christian, you are bound to be struggling with something. That is the true nature of human nature as it is now. As you grow in holiness, you will become more aware of your sinfulness. This is a good thing. Go on hating sin and loving God's law. One day, at Jesus' return, God will wrap up the world as we know it and start again with a new creation. We have that to look forward to, the end of all struggle. In the meantime, the real Christian realizes how sinful he is and that there is no other way of getting right with God other than the rescue that Jesus Christ offers. For which, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.